So we're going to talk about the nervous system tonight. And so what I want to start out with is just going over the different sections. So what I want to start out with is going over the different sections of the nervous system. And so we have what's called the central nervous system. And this is made up of the brain and spinal cord. Now when we talk about the central nervous system, we'll hear people refer to this as the integration. <coughs> I can't spell tonight. This is the integration center. So what does the word integration mean? Combining. What does it mean? Combining. Combining, putting together. What else? Ever heard of anything else for integration? Well, it also means not only being able to put things together, but being able to understand the things that you put together. So this center is able to put all the information from the body together and allow us to understand what to do with it. So it's kind of like the thinking center, okay? Uh, now, which is really interesting because the spinal cord is included in this, which means the spinal cord also has the ability to think. And there are times in our life, which we'll talk about later, that the spinal cord does the thinking instead of the brain. And then informs the brain, oh yeah, by the way, I've already taken care of this for you. So we'll talk about how the spinal cord is able to do this, but the rest of the nervous system is called the peripheral nervous system. And this is everything except the brain and the spinal cord. So this is a very large nervous system. And because it's so large, we're going to break it down into smaller components in just a minute. But basically, information from the body goes up to the spinal cord and the brain so it can be integrated. We can think about it, figure out what to do about it. Then there's also information coming back down from the brain, the spinal cord, to the body so that the body can actually do something about it. If the information is going from the body up to the central nervous system, this is called afferent information. If it's coming from the brain and the spinal cord going out to the body, this is called efferent information. So any information coming from the body and going up towards the brain is going to be sensory information. So this is what we call the sensory division of the peripheral nervous system. This part of the peripheral nervous system helps us to feel various sensations or interpret various sensations. So for instance, you see light, uh, you feel your clothing on your body, uh, somebody tickles you, you're able to feel that. Maybe you get sick to your stomach, you know what that feeling is. So this sensory division of the peripheral nervous system allows us to interpret what's going on around us externally and then also to be able to figure out what's going on or in, uh, inside our body internally. And so this information is going to go up to the central nervous system. And the brain and the spinal cord are then going to figure out what are we supposed to do about it, and then the body's going to respond. That response is part of what's called the motor division. So this information is coming from the brain, coming from the spinal cord, and going out to the body. Now the motor division 
is going to be broken down into basically two parts. One part is that our body can have a response that we call a voluntary response. We have control of that response. So you move a, a muscle, you move your hand, you move your feet, you smile, whatever it is, you've got control of this. Or we may have an involuntary response, which means maybe your heart rate goes up and your blood pressure goes up and you start breathing faster, and this is considered involuntary. So when we're talking about the motor division, we're going to put this into two parts. We're going to have a voluntary portion. And then we're going to have an involuntary portion. So if it's a voluntary response, we call this the somatic nervous system. And this is all about using skeletal muscles. Now by the way, these are still part of the peripheral nervous system. They're just divisions of the peripheral nervous system. So the somatic nervous system is a division of the motor portion, which is a division of the peripheral nervous system. And this allows us to control skeletal muscles so that we can move things in the body. Then the involuntary portion is called the autonomic nervous system, kind of like automatic. And this is the one that's controlling heart rate and blood pressure and respiration, all those different things. Making our heart rate go up, making our heart rate go down. Making our blood pressure go up, making our blood pressure go down. So with the autonomic nervous system, this is going to include cardiac muscle and smooth muscle, as well as glands like salivary glands, sweat glands, these are all going to be controlled by the autonomic nervous system. So sometimes you sweat more, sometimes you sweat less. Now the autonomic nervous system can speed things up, it can slow things down. So it can make heart rate go faster, it can make heart rate go slower. So there's a part of the autonomic nervous system that's responsible for the speeding up, there's a part responsible for the slowing down. So the part that's responsible for speeding things up is called the sympathetic nervous system. stressed out. But what if I am going to be relaxed? And so maybe I want to take a nap. So heart rate needs to go down. Blood pressure needs to go down. Respiration needs to calm down. And the sympathetic nervous system can't do that. So we're going to use another part of the autonomic nervous system called the parasympathetic nervous system. It 
does the opposite to the sympathetic. So if the sympathetic increases heart rate, parasympathetic decreases it. If sympathetic increases blood pressure, parasympathetic makes it go down. If sympathetic makes you sweat more, parasympathetic is going to make you sweat less. The only thing that parasympathetic increases is it increases digestion. <coughs> so that you'll hear people call the parasympathetic the part that is all about resting and digesting. So these are the different portions of our nervous system. Any questions? Pretty straightforward. Just need flashcards. that the nervous system has within it things that we refer to called a neuron. And then we have things that we refer to called a nerve. So you need to know the difference between what is a neuron and what is a nerve. Okay? So a neuron, and I'll show you a picture of one right now, is this right here. A neuron is a cell. It's just a single cell. It's got this funky, long-looking tail thing. We'll go over what the shape is all about in a little bit. But it is still a cell. It's just like the cell we've been talking about. It has a cell membrane with a phospholipid bilayer and integral proteins. It has organelles inside. Uh, it has a nucleus with DNA. It's just like all the other cells, except that it's able to conduct electricity. It conducts electrical impulses from one area of your body to the other. That's what makes neurons different. Now, by the way, one other thing that I want you to know is that neurons do not have these organelles, the centrioles. They don't have any of these. So if neurons don't have centrioles, then what does that say about a neuron? can't divide. It has no ability to divide. So one neuron can't make a second neuron. Now what we say is the neuron can't go through mitosis. Mitosis is cellular division. And since there are no centrioles in a neuron, and it can't go through mitosis, we say it is amitotic. Can't go through mitosis. So the whole neuron is amitotic? The whole neuron is amitotic. It cannot divide. It cannot make new neurons. Okay, now, that's kind of sort of true. It depends on how old you are. So let's pretend that we have somebody who is under five years of age. If you are zero to five years of age, your neurons can actually go through mitosis. Little children under the age of five can build more neurons in their brain. Now, the reason that that's so important is because 
the more neurons you have, the more potential for brilliance. The more neurons you have, typically, if you learn to use them, the smarter you can be. Uh, or maybe the more imaginative you can be. Or maybe the more artistic you can be, depending on how those neurons grow in your brain. But that means that we can actually stimulate young children to grow more neurons. They don't just grow on their own. You have to actually stimulate them so that their neurons go through mitosis. So this is really important, especially if you're working with families who have young children, for you to be able to tell them, hey, look, if you read to your kid, if you sing to your kid, if you play music around your kid, if you let your kid go outside and play, you allow them to build things, you allow them to play with instruments, you do all these different things, it stimulates their brain to make more neurons. And the more neurons they have, the more potential they have to be able to do even better. So like if you get a bad grade in this class, you can blame it on your parents. They didn't help stimulate you to give you enough neurons, and it's all their fault. It's always the parents' fault, right? My parents' fault. I love to blame it on them. <laughs> it's very important that you also know that by giving children especially under the age of five, electronic devices, it stops mitosis of neurons. So all these little kids that already have their iPads and they're like six months old, it is actually not increasing mitosis, it's actually decreasing it. Do you know who Steve Jobs was? Yes. Who was he? The founder of Apple. The founder of Apple. And Steve Jobs, would not allow his children to own or use electronic devices. Their dad owned Apple, and they were not allowed to have an iPhone. They were not allowed to have a computer. They were not allowed to have an iPad. Why do you think that is? It doesn't, it doesn't allow for the uh, neurons in their brain. Yeah, he wanted smart kids. And he knew that even though he was selling them to our kids, it was making them dumb. And he didn't want that to happen to his kids. I'm thinking if Steve Jobs won't give his kids those things, maybe we probably shouldn't give ours. Very interesting. There's a lot of science going on right now that shows that neurologically, these electronic devices also cause addiction. So let's see if you're addicted to your cell phone. Okay? So I'm going to just give you a challenge. My challenge is take your cell phone home, turn it off, Shove it in a drawer and leave it there for a week. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> too long. <laughs> Can you do it? No. Okay. No, you can't. Can you? And it's not. Could I? Yes. Absolutely, without a doubt. Do I be calling you, checking where you are? Cool. Nope. <laughs> and do I care? <laughs> <laughs> would, would I be happier if nobody knew where I was, or yeah. called me, or text me? Oh yes. I would be a much happier camper. The only reason I have a cell phone is because this, and I'm going to take this off of the recording, by the way, this friggin' head place always emails me, calls me, and texts me all the time. And because I'm the department chair, I have to respond. Or I would throw that thing away and crush it. <laughs> but the majority of people can't live without it. Now, what it does is it affects your brain. It actually causes changes in the neurons of your brain. Especially, I'm going to guess, a very high percentage of you are willing to wake up in the middle of the night and text your friends back when they text you at 3 o'clock in the morning. That depends on who it is. Yeah. But you still no, wake up to right. check it, don't you? Yeah. Uh-huh, yeah. Not me. If my kids are dying, good luck to them. <laughs> Nobody better text me at 3 o'clock in the morning. I don't care what's wrong with you. What happens after five years of age that stops mitosis of neurons? Good question. No idea. <laughs> Wouldn't it be cool if we knew, and then we could continue mitosis of the neurons in the brain? Especially if you had someone who had brain damage, and then you could stimulate that mitosis in their brain. How awesome would that be? <laughs> so like regeneration after a stroke or something? Exactly. Exactly. Now, with that question, let's talk about something that is always in the news. This is something called stem cells. Yes. 
Okay. So now the question is, what the heck is a stem cell? Okay. So you got an egg and you got a sperm. And the two of them go on a date and they get together. And they form a baby. Well, not really. What they do is they form a single fertilized cell. It doesn't look like a baby. It's just a cell. Except that single fertilized cell is also what we call a stem cell. Now, eventually that cell will divide, go through mitosis, it'll divide, you get two. They divide, you get four. They divide, you get eight, and so on. And then eventually you form this ball of cells. And it has hundreds of cells in it. Now, some of those cells, now they're all stem cells, by the way. They don't look like anything. They haven't turned into anything. But eventually some of them will get together and they'll form a brain. Some of them will get together, turn into muscles. Some will turn into the skin. Some will turn into your stomach. They start to turn into things we recognize as part of the human body. And you build a baby. But prior to turning into something, these are stem cells. Now, when you're born, when I'm born, we still have some stem cells in our body. And those stem cells can still reproduce. And they typically continue to go through mitosis until we're close to 80 years old. So what the heck do we have all these stem cells for? Because we're already formed. We already got the brain and the heart and all that stuff. Well, what if you break a bone and you have to repair it? You have to grow more bone. So you break a bone and in come the stem cells and they turn into bone and they repair your bone. You scrape a whole bunch of skin off your arm, no big deal, in come the stem cells. They repair the skin, they grow into skin cells. So throughout our life, we use these stem cells to repair. And around 80-ish, somewhere around there, we just don't make any more. And you have to repair things, but then all of a sudden, you don't have any more stem cells. And what if you, like, break a bone now and you're 98 years old? And you've probably heard of people being that age and the bone just won't heal. But what if we could take somebody else's stem cells and inject them into that person? Would those stem cells then heal that bone? And the answer is yes. They don't need to be compatible or anything? No, they don't because stem cells don't have anything on the outside to show that they belong to you. They don't affect your immune system. And then when they're injected into your body, they turn into cells that look like they belong to you. So they fool your immune system completely. So for instance, uh, last June, this was the first time a surgery like this was done. It was done in London. And there was a gentleman who was an Olympic athlete. He was a downhill skier. And he had been in a really bad accident while skiing, and it broke his back. And he severed his spinal cord, cut it in half. And he became what we call quadriplegic, which means that from the neck down, he's paralyzed. Okay? So his spinal cord is cut in half. And what these doctors decided to do was try to inject stem cells into his spinal cord to see if they would turn into neurons, the cells that make up your spinal cord and your brain, and repair that spinal cord. And they did. And he now is able to walk, and he is able to use his arms, and he is not paralyzed anymore, and it regenerated his spinal cord. So why don't they do that with everyone? They are starting to do that with everyone. They are starting to inject these stem cells into people to repair the spinal cord and to repair the brain. For instance, like your stroke patients, things, people who have had, you know, traumatic brain injuries, they are actually starting to do it and it's working. So it's very new. It is very new. Very, very new. We have a, a person who works here at the college and he was in an automobile accident and uh, he actually had a huge cut, very deep wound on the back of his foot. And it just, it wasn't healing, wasn't healing. And we're talking six, eight months of this wound not healing at all. Nothing, no skin was growing, it just was terrible. And of course, infection is a big problem. 
And he had gone to a whole bunch of different doctors, and I finally told him, you know, why don't you try stem cell therapy? So he did. And uh, I saw him today, and after three months of stem cell therapy, he's wearing a sock and shoes, and all he has on it is a little Band-Aid, and it's almost completely healed. So what they did is they injected, once a week, they injected stem cells into the wound, and it was able to heal itself. Now, he didn't take my advice on the other thing, though, because I told him, stop smoking because he's a seriously heavy smoker, and smoking prevents wound healing. And so, but the stem cells healed it just in time for him to like die of lung cancer. But anyway, <laughs> it healed. Where are they getting most of the stem cells? Ah, excellent question. Where do you get these stem cells from? Well, uh, yes and no. So, let's talk about it. Still a little controversial for some people because the majority, not all, the majority of stem cells are coming from aborted fetuses. Okay? So whether you agree or disagree with abortion, okay, I don't want to go into that today, uh, but I do want to tell you how it's done, how they collect it from the fetus. So what they do is they take this aborted fetus and they put it in a blender, just like the blender you'd make a milkshake with at home. Turn that blender on and blend that fetus. And for most people, it doesn't matter if you agree or disagree with abortion. For most people, it's like, that's gross. And it really is. I've seen it done, and I had to walk out of the room. And I don't have to walk out of the room on very many things. And uh, so it was, it was really bad. And then what they do is they actually put it through like a sieve, and they're able to separate those stem cells. So lots of people vary against the stem cells. However, we have stem cells, so if you had a friend who needed stem cells, you could donate, okay? Which is really good, too, because you've got to be careful that wherever these stem cells come from, there isn't disease coming from wherever you get them. The other thing now is there's a brand new instrument, which is awesome. You can donate your own stem cells to your own self and also get skinnier at the same time. Ah, because you do it through liposuction. Your fat has a lot of stem cells in it. And so there's a machine that they have just introduced that you can suck out some of the fat that a person has, and then it separates out their own stem cells, and then you can use those stem cells to inject into other sites of the body. And so that seems to be working very, very well, and now you're not looking at controversy with aborted fetuses or diseases, you know, hopefully you don't have any, but, you know, that's a big issue to me. So if we can donate, like, our own stem cells, can we like, eventually stop using um, aborted fetuses? Yes. Yes. Can they use animals for it, too? They can't give you animal stem cells, because animal stem cells turn into animal tissue. <laughs> that would be weird. <laughs> what that mean? You're all skin. <laughs> I don't know, and I don't think that they've ever done that. Now, here's the big deal. Here's where the research is going with stem cells. This is the big deal. Can I take stem cells, put it in a petri dish, and give it some kind of signal, some kind of chemicals, whatever, and cause those stem cells to grow a heart? Yes. yes. Not yet, but they're working on it. Or maybe I can cause them to grow a kidney, mm -hmm. okay? What they have to work on, what they have to figure out is, what's the signal that tells those stem cells to become a heart, or to become a kidney, or to become whatever? What chemicals do we put on them to say, okay, turn into this? They've been able to figure out how to make them turn into skin, which is really cool, but they haven't been able to make any other kind of organ. But I, I... Don't put it past them. They're, they're going to figure this out. So now you could donate your own stem cells in case you need a heart transplant. They could build your, your heart. So let's say somebody has a liposuction and then they store, they store the fat somewhere uh -huh. and then give it to you later, like a year later or Absolutely, something? Absolutely, you can do that. So you can take the liposuction, let's say, separate your stem cells, and then you can freeze those stem cells. So they put it in liquid nitrogen, they freeze those stem cells, you defrost them later, they're still good to go. Oh, that They could be frozen for years, years and years and years. Absolute years. Now, this is also why if you've ever had a child, uh, they might ask you at the hospital, do you want to save your umbilical cord and freeze it? Because the umbilical cord is also oh, packed stem with stem cells. It's a little bit expensive to keep those stem cells frozen, it's like 200 bucks a month, but this is why. 
because you could freeze them for many, many years. And in case you needed them later, there you go. Freeze your own kids' uh, stem cells in case he needs a heart transplant later. And then would you be able to donate it to somebody else? Absolutely. Anybody can use anybody's stem cells. Yes? So could they just like liposuctional the dead people? No. <laughs> that could be alive. <laughs> that, that's a good question. Stem, all of our cells upon death immediately change. They do not work the same way. So since they're not, most mothers aren't keeping their umbilical cords and freezing them. Why don't we? Put it in your day or It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Why can't they use that instead of fetuses? They can. Yeah, those kids like side Why don't they? they? Mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> I, honestly, you want my personal opinion? My personal opinion is it's too much work to go get the umbilical cord because the abortion clinics will actually pack up a fetus and ship it to your front door. So the scientists will have it come right to the door of their laboratory, and most scientists I know are pretty lazy. <laughs> and so they don't want to go to a hospital, collect all these umbilical cords, because the hospital isn't going to ship it and send it to you. They're just not going to do it. That's, that's, that's my personal that. opinion why they do it. Now, we don't really use the aborted fetuses now really for anything except research. So everybody else, when you're getting stem cells, you're getting them from stem cell donors. So I do think eventually it's going to go away from the aborted fetuses because if you're a researcher, if you can get stem cells in a different place where there's no controversy, mm -hmm. you're probably not going to have anybody picketing outside your front door. And there are some people, like I did research for a number of years at Loma Linda, and you get death threats all the time. If they don't think your research is appropriate, maybe you're using an animal in your research, or you're using aborted fetuses, whatever, there's people who, you know, I got a telephone call one time because I was using monkeys for research, and the person on the other end said, I know where your kids go to school, and they did because they told me where. You need to stop doing this, or we'll research on your kids like you're researching on the monkeys. They, they don't care. They're absolute terrorists. Why does the, the cells change like when someone dies but not in an aborted baby? They do, but those are being used for research, so they're not all that worried about it. And they usually cryo-freeze those fetuses pretty quick. So they're aborted, they stick them in liquid nitrogen. So they just have a tank right there, and they're cryo-frozen pretty quick. So they don't have the ability to change too much. But yeah, that's a great question. So, <laughs> all right, let's get started again. We're going to talk now about the different parts of a neuron. And so I just want to show you what a neuron looks like and then label those parts and then we'll discuss nerve because we haven't gotten to that yet. So I know this is a funky drawing. Um, I think I might have told this class, maybe not. Uh, my father is a professional artist. I have a daughter who is a professional artist. And then I get stuck with this. So I'm thinking maybe it's artistic skips. ability skips a generation like baldness does. Okay, yeah. so that's all I can say is my artistic ability sucks. Okay, so these are supposed to represent a part of the neuron called the dendrites. This region here is referred to as the cell body. Now we have the small area here, which is the axon hillock. The largest region of the neuron, this is called the axon. And then this portion down here is called the telodendria. So these are all the parts of a neuron.
after the other. And information moves in this direction. But originally, the neuron is going to be stimulated somehow at the dendrite. So maybe you step on a tack and the dendrite of your neuron is stimulated, you feel pain. Maybe you put your hand in cold water, the cold water stimulates the dendrites of that neuron, you're able to perceive cold. But the dendrites are where stimulation of the neuron occurs. Does the number of dendrites matter? Nope. It has a lot more than what I drew. <laughs> Just so you basically get the idea. Now, where the two neurons meet, so in this area here, where they meet, this is what we call the synapse. So neuron number one is going to pass information to neuron number two, and that information is going to stimulate at the dendrites of neuron number two. But where the two of them come together, this is called the synapse. There is a very small separation, now it looks huge the way I've drawn it, but there's a very small separation or gap between neuron number one and neuron number two. <coughs> this gap is called the synaptic cleft. Now it's a tiny, tiny gap. So if my fingers were neurons, they would practically be touching each other. The gap is so tiny between the two. So now because neuron number one is coming before the synapse, you'll hear people refer to this as the presynaptic neuron. And because neuron number two comes after the synapse, then we can call this the postsynaptic neuron. If there was another neuron after this one, this one would turn into the presynaptic neuron, and the next one would turn into the postsynaptic neuron. So it just depends on which neurons you're looking at. So there could be another one in front of that one. But there could be. be these two. Right. Okay. Exactly. What would the first one be called? Still the presynaptic? Pre uh huh. Is there a, is there a, is there a limit of number? A number of presynaptic neurons that you can have? Or There's no limit you could have, but the body doesn't have a bunch of them. So usually maximum is about four to five. Sometimes there's only one. So it just kind of depends. Depends on where in the body things are happening. Okay, so if you look at the overhead. 
it for a minute. This would be like neuron number one. So here are the dendrites, and the dendrites are being stimulated, and then the information goes in this direction. So where neuron number one, the presynaptic neuron, and neuron number two here, the postsynaptic neuron meet, this is the synapse. So we're going to stimulate this postsynaptic neuron, and then the information is going to go in this direction to the next neuron. Okay? And it's electrical information that's traveling down these neurons. It's kind of like, you know, the electrical information that would be like in the cord of my computer. So it's plugged in and electricity is running through here. Notice one thing really important though, is that the reason I'm willing to hold this is because there's insulation around these wires. What would happen if I were to hold this and there was no insulation around these wires? Yeah, ow, <laughs> that would not be good, okay? We have insulation around our neurons as well. This insulation is this stuff right here. It wraps around and around and around, and it's what we refer to as myelin. Myelin. similar to what they have in the heart? In the heart? Is that what you said? In the heart? Yeah. No. No. No, the heart doesn't have something this. Else. No. I mean, you must be thinking of something different. So this myelin is made out of fat, and it wraps around our neurons and allows the electrical information to just keep going down in a particular direction. So for instance, if I were to take this electrical cord and I were to take the insulation off, you know that the electricity would shock me. That's because it's leaving the wire and it's going into my body. Now it's supposed to just go from point A at the plug to point B at my computer so it will charge up. I don't want it to leave the cord and go into my body. It's the same thing with the information going down our neuron. We want it to go straight from one neuron to the next to the next. We don't want any of the information to arc out the sides. Because if it does, really two things happen. One, if the information isn't going down the neuron and it starts arcing out the sides, you start to lose some energy and what is traveling down the neuron goes a lot slower. So that if I'm thinking, oh, I want to move my finger, well, it's traveling slower now. It's going to take a little bit more time for my finger to finally move. Or if maybe I'm walking along and all of a sudden it's like my neuron short circuits because I've lost the insulation, my leg may not pick up and move. And we do have a disease called multiple sclerosis. This is an autoimmune disease. An autoimmune disease means that our own immune system has gone crazy and for whatever reason it's attacking our own body. And for some people who have multiple sclerosis, their immune system attacks the myelin insulation around the outside of their neurons and literally starts to chew it off so that their neurons will eventually short circuit. So when they do want to move a finger, it does take forever. Or if they are walking, all of a sudden their leg won't move because the information didn't get from point A to point B, and they're not able to use those muscles or whatever it might be. And one of the biggest problems for them is eventually they have difficulty breathing. So they can end up in wheelchairs, they can end up on a respirator, uh, it can be a real problem for them. Of course now the really good thing is, we talked about this a little bit, that there are immunosuppressant drugs out there to turn off this rogue immune system so that it doesn't keep killing the individual. And that's good and it's bad. But at least it slows down the multiple sclerosis. Any questions about this so far? Yeah. Uh, 
Is that word excellent? Hillock or Hillock? Hillock. C-K. Sorry. Uh, by the way, um, when you're looking at myelin, it's white. So if you've ever heard people call things white matter or gray matter, you have neurons that look white, and then you have neurons that look gray. The white neurons have myelin insulation around them. The gray neurons don't. And by the way, gray neurons have problems with conducting electricity. It goes a lot slower because there's not enough, as much myelin, or there's no myelin, I should say, around them. So again, this is just a bigger picture showing you a neuron. These are all the dendrites. And then this is the cell body. Axon hillock here. And then this is the axon with myelin around it. And then here's our telodendria at the end. Is how they try, like their spaces, is that how it shows or it just shows that? Is it, is it just what spaces? Just, like on the axon? Or is it just to show us that there's... No, but it's really like that with okay. the spaces. Mm -hmm. yep. All right. So one of the other things that I want you to know is that at the end of this presynaptic neuron, there are these kind of basketball-like structures. They're literally <coughs> looking like a basketball. There's something that we refer to as a vesicle. And we have a whole bunch of these at the end of a neuron. And inside this vesicle is a certain kind of chemical. Not every neuron has its own chemical. There's not multiple different types. But whatever the chemical is, we call this a neurotransmitter. This is the chemical that's going to be released that stimulates or turns on the next neuron. So we have neurotransmitters that are at the end of this presynaptic neuron. They're going to be released, and the neurotransmitter chemical will stimulate the postsynaptic neuron to send electrical information down it. So the little balls are the vesicles? Those are the vesicles, and they have in them the neurotransmitter. So again, if you look at the overhead here, you can see like these little ball-like things. Yeah. Uh, this is actually made out of like cell membrane. It's a phospholipid bilayer. And inside of these vesicles are the neurotransmitter. So the vesicles get released with the neurotransmitter. That crosses the synapse, and it binds to the next neuron and causes the next neuron to be stimulated. Now, these neurotransmitters can be affected by certain drugs. And we're talking legal as well as illegal drugs. And so we do have medications that will affect neurotransmitters. So for instance, we have a lot of people, more than ever before, who are very depressed. Mm -hmm. The number of depressed individuals in the United States has gone up dramatically. And the age at which people are being diagnosed as being depressed has actually decreased dramatically. So that you have two and three year olds who are being diagnosed as depressed. Which makes you wonder, what the heck is going on? Why are there so many people depressed? Now, there are neurotransmitters that we make in our brain that stimulate our brain to make us feel happy. And so some of these neurotransmitters are things we call like dopamine and serotonin and norepinephrine and acetylcholine. These are some names of neurotransmitters and maybe you've heard of some of those before. And so a lot of scientists, um, they're kind of in two different camps. Camp number one, the reason that there are so many depressed people and so many depressed children is because y'all don't eat enough fat in your diet and the myelin coating is made out of fat. And if you don't have enough fat in your diet, your myelin coating starts to wear off. Your neurons don't function appropriately. They short circuit. Voila, you get depression and a number of other things like ADD and things like that. 
lots of uh, autism and dementia and Alzheimer's, higher rates than ever in history. If they start eating more fat again, would it build back up or is it? It does help, it? yes. It does help. For instance, they did a big scientific study on Alzheimer's patients. They put those Alzheimer's patients on a ketogenic diet and compared them to patients who were not. The patients with Alzheimer's actually did significantly better. Their brains healed a lot more, and the people who were not on that diet just progressed downward. So you can slow the disease and even create some healing. So yeah, you want to catch it before, as yeah. early as possible. But so, okay, there's camp number one. Camp number two is that something's going on, and they have no idea what it is, but something's going on so that for some reason, people all of a sudden can't make as many of these neurotransmitters just can't make as many. And they have no explanation why all of a sudden so many people can't make as many of these neurotransmitters. But if you can't make as many, you don't feel so good. So what they've done is they've come up with all kinds of drugs, legal medication, to help you make more of these neurotransmitters. Or to help your neurons become more sensitive to the neurotransmitters. And so they give people like Prozac and Wellbutrin and all of these antidepressant medications which are supposed to help make more neurotransmitters or stimulate the neuron greater so that the depression isn't as bad. So uh, just to clarify, um, prescription and illegal drugs can both ruin the neurotransmitters, Yes. Correct? Yes, so you have to be very careful with that. You have to be careful the types of medications sometimes that you give patients because you could be giving them medication for one thing and create havoc in their neurotransmitters and now they're seriously depressed. Mm -hmm. So you have to think about some of the side effects. Are they worth it? Mm -hmm. Like, for instance, a student came to me this morning and she says, yeah, you know, my mom pulled a muscle right about here. It hurts really, really bad. So she went into the doctor's. And I'm thinking, okay, put a little heat, put a little cold, yeah. take a little bit of aspirin, you know, you should be okay. Down some Motrin, whatever. They gave her steroids. What? <laughs> Two weeks of steroids. And I looked at her and I go, what? And she described the steroids and everything, and I'm thinking, do you have any idea the side effects that you can have from taking two weeks of steroids, including changing your neurotransmitter levels and putting you into depression? I'm like, why did they just tell her a little heat, a little cold, and call me in the morning, you know, type of thing. Uh, weird. I think sometimes they don't think about, for little things like that, the side effects are just ridiculous. It's tremendous side effects that your patient can have, and it could potentially take them, even if you only take it for two weeks, it could take them months <coughs> to come back to normal. So you're not only affecting them for maybe a couple days afterwards. You may be affecting them for months and months, depending on what the medication is. So you have to be very careful about that. Now, by the way, some of the illegal drugs, they really affect neurotransmitters. And you know, if you work in any hospital in San Bernardino County, you're going to come up against some people who have been doing some illegal drugs, OK? Because like, woohoo, high desert, you should know. You should be <laughs> proud, 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 because we are the methamphetamine capital of the world, OK? You just come out to Lucerne Valley, people are blowing themselves up all the time. Take a walk out there, and all of a sudden, I smell a whiff of is that ether? Oh, they must be cooking today. <laughs> That's great. Okay. So what these drugs do is they can change your neurotransmitter levels too. So for instance, if somebody if somebody takes cocaine, it will change your neurotransmitter levels forever. You will never be able to make as much as you did before. You take cocaine one time, you will always be just a little bit more depressed than you were before. You take it two times, your neurotransmitter level falls a little bit more. Take it three times, the levels fall a little bit more. So what happens? i got to take more and more and more of the drug to try to get my neurotransmitter levels back up so that I can feel good. And, you know, they'll tell you I'm always chasing that first high because that's the only time I actually felt a little bit better. And the same goes, by the way, with marijuana. The same goes with speed these change neurotransmitter levels. 
So no matter what your patients are telling you or what the, you know, pharmaceutical companies who now sell marijuana tell you, uh, they do affect neurotransmitters in the brain. And you see a lot of people who smoke marijuana becoming very seriously depressed. I have a very, very good friend. I've known her since we were in kindergarten together, so it's been a long time. And just went to visit her. And uh, she started smoking marijuana when we were in college and has continued to do so. And um, now she has some very, very serious deficits. Uh, she has some brain deficits. Uh, she's pretty much destroyed her thyroid. She's taking all kinds of medication just to try to keep her from being suicidally depressed. So you have to remember that even though you hear all these things on the news that, oh, you know, marijuana doesn't hurt you, uh, look at the scientific literature and be aware because you need to work with the people who are using these drugs. And you need to be aware of not what the drug dealer is saying about it, but what the scientific literature is saying about the health of your patient and the use of some of these medications, uh, like marijuana, and how they affect the brain and the rest of the body. There is actually no true scientific literature out there that says anything positive about smoking marijuana. Not one positive health benefit. Now there are some things out there about different chemicals that are found in marijuana like cannabinoids that help to decrease inflammation. Uh, there's different ways of using uh, that medication like in lotions and things like that. But smoking it, it brings a very high percentage into the body and can cause a lot of neurological deficits. So you need to be aware, as the medical personnel, what this is doing to your patient. Any questions? I'm surprised you should have heard my afternoon class when I said that. <laughs> Holy cow. Got a little bit touchy there. I probably know which ones are. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying, maybe it's a different class than y'all. <laughs> a little bit different than you guys. Alright, so let's talk about the brain and the spinal cord. And then after we do that, I have a surprise for you. I'm going to bring in a human brain so that we can all play with it today. Alright? Now see, when I said that to the class this afternoon, they all just looked at me. I brought it out, we talked about it, I showed them everything, and they're just like, oh, just looking at me. I know it's going to be totally different when I bring it out tonight. <laughs> All right, so our spinal cord, not real strong, really actually pretty small. The spinal cord in diameter is only about the size of a dime. It's not very big at all, and it's really weak. It's kind of jelly-like, and so you got to protect it, which is why you have vertebrae. So look at this top picture here. Here's bone, and here's bone. And right in the center is the teeny tiny spinal cord. Now, here you can see a picture of the spinal cord a little bit blown up. And this is all white matter. This in the middle is gray matter. So that the spinal cord out here, these neurons have myelin around it. In the spinal cord here, these neurons do not have myelin around it. So you can see the difference. Now, what does the spinal cord do for us? Well, it is a freeway, so that electrical information is going up and down the spinal cord to and from the brain all day long. But, remember I told you, it can also do some thinking. And where the spinal cord does its finest thinking is in reflexes. So that when you and I have a reflex, the spinal cord is totally in control. And as a matter of fact, one of the things I'm going to tell you is when you start to develop reflexes, make sure you do it right. So I'll give you a couple pieces of information here. So let's say that you put your hand on a hot stove, right? You want to get your hand off of there as quick as possible because it's going to cause damage. Yeah. So what if the brain was involved? 
The information has to go up your arm, up your spinal cord, to your brain. The brain processes it, sends it down your spinal cord, down your arm. By then, you burnt your hand off. Yeah. Okay? If it's just the spinal cord, it goes up the arm to the spinal cord, back down again, your hand's gone. Pull it off. No more burning. So it's very, very quick. What if, let's say you're driving down the road and, you know, minding your own business, some idiot cuts you off, and you got to do these magnificent NASCAR moves <laughs> to get your car on the road, you don't kill anybody, and afterwards you go, dang, I'm pretty good. I don't know how I did that, but that's really cool. That's a reflex. Your spinal cord took over. Your brain actually had no idea at the moment what was happening. Now, afterwards, the spinal cord says to the brain, oh, hey, by the way, we yeah, just did this. And then you go, oh, wow, okay. That's pretty cool. And you're aware that all those actions occurred. Now, that's because you learned to drive, and you've practiced, and you have all these moves that you didn't even know you had because you've been practicing them. I'll give you a negative one. So this was a few years ago on the 15 freeway. Uh, this highway patrolman pulls a guy over. Mm -hmm. And he calls into dispatch and says, hey, look, I'm pulling this guy over. And he's supposed to call back in about five minutes or so to tell dispatch he's OK. He doesn't. So dispatch sends out a second highway patrolman a little bit later. That highway patrolman calls in and says, hey, look, I see the car, and uh, let me get out and see what's going on. He never calls back. Now, I don't know why the dispatch did not get it through their thick head that this was a problem yet, but they sent three more highway patrolmen out. All five of them never called back. <laughs> so finally, they go, oh, maybe there's a problem here, and they send in the cavalry. They send all kinds of police officers in. And when they get there, they find all five highway patrolmen on the ground dead. Okay, now that's bad enough, but something really weird was happening too. All five of these officers were right-handed, but their guns were in their left hand. And when they looked at their right hand, each one of them had two shell casings in their right hand. Which a shell casing is when you pull the trigger, the, the brass comes out the side. And that's the shell casing. And they had two of those in their right hand. And it turns out, when they looked at it later, each officer had only fired their gun twice while the bad guy was firing at them. So they did a big investigation on this because obviously there's a big reflex problem. And what they found was the Highway Patrol had a gun range. And they had recently hired a new guy to be in charge of the gun range, what they call the range master. And he had put up notes all over the gun range. I'm not your mom. Clean up after yourself. Only fire twice and then pick up your shell casings. <laughs> so do you see what happened? Yeah. They practice. Boom, boom. Stop. Put their gun in their left hand. Bend down pick up their shell casings. And then boom, boom, put your gun in your left hand, bend down, pick up your shell casings. And you do this over and over and over again, and eventually it gets stuck in your spinal cord. And now it's a reflex. So that when they got to the scene of crime and a bad guy was shooting at them, they could only, because the spinal cord took over, the brain was not even involved. It was not invited to the party. And they shot twice, put their gun in their left hand, bent over to pick their shell casings, while the bad guy was still firing at them. Now, needless to say, there's no sign like that anymore. And no police officer in the state of California is allowed to clean up their own shell casings. There's probably a really good reason for that. Because that's a very bad habit. So you have to be learning good habits because when the reflex occurs, you want that good habit to happen because your brain is not going to be involved. And no matter what you try to do, you won't be able to think your way out of the situation because the spinal cord takes over. Weird, huh? Any questions? Yeah? When you're being shot at a cycle cop, would, why wouldn't the response to just keep shooting that instead because, of? Because when you get in that stressful situation, 
your spinal cord says, oh, we're in a stressful situation, I'll be in charge, thank you. And whatever reflex you have learned is stored in the spinal cord, and that's what it uses. So one of the things police are taught is even if you're in this stressful situation, try your hardest not to stress. Because if you try your hardest not to look at it as a stress, your brain will still be in charge. So does the spinal cord only take over when you're under stress? Usually, yes. However, that's not always the case. So for instance, you and I have learned how to walk. Walking has become a reflex. Mm -hmm. So we don't have to think about walking. The spinal cord does it for us. So that doesn't have to be stressful. But yes, in stressful situations, it really takes over. So what about like breathing? Is that voluntary or involuntary? Involuntary. You but, can, but you can control you it. You can control it, but only to a point. Because you passed out.